It says your stream has ended. You're no longer live. Let me try again. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Thanks for joining us today for this discussion. Our topic is banking changed rapidly due to COVID. New models are needed. Banking at retail and commercial levels relied on well understood processes, but COVID rapidly changed demands. Presently, new models are needed incorporating fintech and person to person exchanges. Who is leading the push into new processes? How is the developed banking sector moving into the populous nations of Africa and Asia? What will the new integration look like? So that's the topic of our discussion. My name is Lisa Senhauser Kelly. My background is traditional financial services, and I have a healthy interest in fintech innovation, as well as new paradigms of leadership and equality. I'm honored to be able to join you on this panel today. Um, I was able to meet all of you earlier in the week and then again uh, just now. And the only way that we can get all of your voices heard is to let you jump right in. So I will start by letting you introduce yourselves. If I may, I'm going to start with you, Marguerite, from the Netherlands, from The Hague in the Netherlands. Can you yes. introduce yourself and tell us what is your interest or role in the future of banking and what is the topic that got you onto the panel today? Thank you so much, Lisa, and welcome to you all. Uh, I'm very pleased to be here. Uh, I'm actually in The Hague between the Peace Palace and the International Criminal Court, so I live in a city of peace and I hope that soon we will be able to celebrate peace as we should be. Um, I'm uh, acting, I'm working for, uh, for Aeon. Um, uh, Aeon, as you all know, is a risk advisor in, in, uh, for people and risk. I've been working for Aeon for 32 years. Uh, after my law degree, I started working in insurance and reinsurance. And at the moment, I am uh, in charge of the holdings for Aeon. Aeon consolidates 7 billion of its 11 billion revenue through the Netherlands, and I'm in charge of that board. Next to it, I'm a non-exec at various different companies, uh, a startup called Cal Blue, which is looking at a more sustainable and rewilding oceans. Um, I'm also active on the American Chamber of Commerce board in the Netherlands and on the board there. Um, member of Harvard Business School alumni board. Um, and the reason for me joining this session today on banking, which some of you might wonder, like, what's she doing in a banking exercise? Because she's an insurance broker, I am, for sure. Uh, but I was, I'm very much involved in diversity and inclusion. And as such, uh, as I'm also the nationwide Dutch ambassador for diversity and inclusion, and also represent the Netherlands at the G20, the Women Empowerment Initiative of the G20, uh, I've been involved in an exercise uh, of a Dutch bank who was looking into the topic of inclusive banking. Uh, and I will be talking a little bit more about that later. I'm married. Uh, my husband is a pilot. I have two children who are out of the house. Uh, so um, let's uh, maybe to start off with, Lisa, back to you. Thank you very much, Marguerite. Wow, that's really, really very impressive. Um, I'd like to now go over to Andrea, currently based in the UK. Andrea, why are you here today? Tell us about yourself and why you're here. Wonderful. Thank you, Lisa. I'm really excited to be here. Um, so I'm, I'm head of our Canadian portfolio here at Nesta Challenges, though my work spans both Canada and the UK. Um, so if you don't know us, Nesta is an innovation foundation in the UK. Um, and in our Nesta Challenges team, I design and deliver a portfolio of challenge prizes or, or innovation competitions that invest in social purpose entrepreneurs and in small businesses uh, tackling big problems. And so in this role, one of my core focus areas has been um, banking and, and financial services. Um, and so my first project started um, with, with open banking related initiatives. So in 2017, uh, before open banking was, was live in the UK, um, we ran a data sandbox and an innovation competition with, with the Competition Markets Authority uh, to support fintech innovators developing new open banking enabled products and services, and also to create an important feedback loop between regulators and, and fintechs. Um, we then ran a follow-up project in, in 2020, which included a national marketing campaign and, and experiments to figure out how to increase consumer adoption of open banking powered products. Um, but that project also had more of a, of, of a financial inclusion focus and highlighted how open banking uh, can enable tools and services to, to support financial inclusion. Um, and, and since then, my portfolio has continued to focus on fintech innovation, but more specifically, 
um, fintech innovation focused on on financial inclusion. Um, and so that brought me to uh, to uh, help lead Nest's COVID response project to scale fintech solutions um, at, at the start of COVID, and, and also work on a project funded by the UK Treasury uh, that we ran to to improve uh, people's access to responsible, affordable credit through. Uh, a community lender and, and fintech partnerships. Um, so overall, my, my relationship to the future of banking has really been you know, thinking about how we can uh, drive innovation to help uh, you know, create better financial inclusion. Thank you very much, Andrea. And now to Spain, Federico, would you introduce yourself and your relationship to the future of banking? Hi, good afternoon, everyone, or good morning for those uh, across the Atlantic. My name is Federico Travella. I'm Belgian and Italian, and I'm a technology entrepreneur. I'm the founder and the CEO of a company called NoviCap. We are building the most advanced um, end-to-end working capital system for um, SMEs and mid-market companies. And as a technology entrepreneur, I very much have uh, learned how to innovate and, and adapt to a more traditional banking industry of you know, incumbents that... Um, are, are lacking the technology or have certain inefficiencies that don't allow them to operate in the SME finance space. And that has very much been the, the thesis around uh, starting NoviCap as a, as a fintech uh, company. Um, before NoviCap, um, I was a managing director at Rocket Internet, a global venture builder, where I was uh, witnessing a, a different sort of um, inefficiencies, but also relate sometimes to financial services namely how technology can help uh, leapfrog certain industries. Um, indeed, one of the companies I've helped uh, build under the Rocket Internet umbrella is a company called Lazada, which helped to uh, completely disrupt um, e-commerce or uh, retail in, in Southeast Asia. And uh, naturally, um, once you start to bring on board uh, these, these uh, new consumers, you also start to realize uh, the opportunities in, uh, in banking those, those consumers. Um, otherwise, I'm uh, trained as a geologist um, at the Ghent University in Belgium. i am uh, been advising the European Commission on its technology and entrepreneurship agenda, which I think now is starting to create a nice entrepreneurial re- renaissance in, uh, in Europe. And uh, lastly, I'm a Young Talent uh, Fellow at the ESC Business School here in, uh, in Barcelona. Thanks for having me. Fantastic. And now we're going to... Uh over to the US, to Miami, to Vivian, please. Hello, everybody. I'm Vivian Portela. I'm a Brazilian based in the US. Thank you for the introduction, Lisa. Um, I'm one of the partners of BNT Group. It's a financial institution group from Brazil. I'm also CEO of BNT Global in the US and one of the founders of Zero Bank. It's a digital bank cryptocurrency uh, friendly in Brazil. Uh, I think I was driven in this panel uh, because we have a a 30 year company financial institution and we also launched two fintechs in the last two years. So we have clearly what is the traditional and what is the new models that need to to, um, be uh, for the banking future. So, this is it, it, it really was a challenge for for us and but I think uh, financial institution traditionals must uh, adapt must adapt That's it. Thank you and last but not least Mariam calling in from Jamaica. Hi morning everyone thank you again for having me. Um, I'm Mariam McIntosh Robinson. I am the CEO of First Global Bank. It's a commercial bank operating in Jamaica, but it's part of a larger conglomerate, the Grace Kennedy Group, about 750 million in revenues. And I sit on the executive committee of the group and responsible for the bank. Um, I actually, you know, when I think about why I'm here and what we are passionate about at the Grace Kennedy Group and First Global Bank, it is exactly as the other panelists have said, financial inclusion and access to capital. And so for us at First Global, we have led the banking sector industry in Jamaica around really pushing on financial inclusion. In fact, it was a strategy before COVID, but once COVID came, 
um, the inequalities, the lack of access and just the health crisis uh, really pushed us to figure out how do we make our words into action as quickly as possible. We signed up 10,000 unbanked Jamaicans in the four month period in 2020 between June and September. Um, by figuring out just how to get it done. All very AML CFT compliant. And so I actually think, you know, COVID has been a what I call kind of a spark in terms of ensuring that we put our money where our mouth is and really figure out how do we get so many of the unbanked people around the world, not just in the Caribbean or Africa, but in developed nations as well, to have access to the financial services sector. Just, just, um, just kind of on a personal note, I um, grew up in Jamaica, uh, most of my professional life was actually spent in the U.S. I was a strategy consultant at McKinsey and & Company and Bain and & Company for many years, Bain. And then I went off to do private equity in the Caribbean, working with the largest private equity fund. Um, and that's when I realized just the impact of SMEs on growth in a region and the barrier, the biggest barrier being access to capital. I was sitting on the, ba- the board of this bank and the CEO left in January 2016. And they asked me, because so logical, not really, but they asked me to step in to be the CEO. And it's been a fantastic experience um, so far. But again, just to be very clear, there are two main challenges that we go after um, that we see in the world. One is just literally how do you allow people to move money across borders at the smallest cost possible? I forgot to mention that for the Grace Kennedy Group, we have the Western Union contracts or the largest remittance business in the Caribbean serving the various corridors. That's one. That's one challenge. Moving movement of money and that traditional business is being disrupted. Uh, And the second is access to capital with a focus on women. And for our bank, we have been rolling out products that are not broadly saying, hey, women, come to us, but being very targeted and specific. As an example, if you are a female entrepreneur and you've just had a baby, we give you a moratorium immediately for three months. This is our maternity period in Jamaica. Just to make it very practical, if you're a female entrepreneur and your business is under 24 months, we have a $15 million, Jamaican dollars not much, but $15 million facility to allow you to grow your business. So this is our passion. And again, First Global Bank and part of the Grace Kennedy Group. So good to be here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mariam. Um, Marguerite, is banking inclusive? Thank you very much, uh, Lisa. I don't think banking is as exclusive as it could be. Uh, So it's really important to know that uh, there's various group of people who actually feel underserved in banking. And absolute numbers, women actually form the largest group, approximately 76 Six percent of women in the largest economies feel that they're not included and that financial advisors don't understand them um, uh, or not interested in even in serving them. And at the same time, women, women form a very relevant group in banking because, you know, two thirds of all global household spending is being controlled by women um, and 40 percent of total, total global wealth is being held by women. If you take a look at uh, what is the potential of women for the banking industry, it was estimated that better serving women could contribute to 611 billion euros in additional uh, uh, annual revenues for financial providers uh, globally. So this is really an interesting number. And if you take a look at inclusive banking, it's a big topic. I'm actually covering now really the gender related aspect. Uh, And if you allow me, I'll give you some, uh, some, 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 some background why the Netherlands took out this survey, ABN Embro Bank. Um, uh, took out a survey and uh, quite a large research the past six months. And the reason why so was because Alison Rose, the CEO of NetVest in the UK, uh, did a similar kind of research in 2019 and she presented her results three years ago. Uh, and it became clear that indeed women are a very large group underserved uh, audience for banks. And so what we did was actually uh, lifting on this extra excellent research, we uh, there was a group found in the Netherlands uh, by ABN and McKinsey. So uh, Miriam, uh, your friends from McKinsey were involved, uh, and they invited experts like myself to take a look along. And what we actually did was that um, uh, we looked at um, uh, five groups. Just to give you some background, because it's interesting to deep dive a little bit, they actually focus on five female focus group, which was one women on a tight budget, two wealthy women three female entrepreneurs, four fluent women, and five female young professionals. And so we researched those uh, those groups in qualitative and quantitative matters, and we actually identified key moments in women's life stages during which banking and finances actually play a role. Um, and also we were really looking into what barriers actually those women experience. 
Now, so I already mentioned Alison Rose. I do think that everybody interested in this topic should get the ABN AMRO report. You can find it on the website, but also the NetBest Alison Rose review. She just three days ago published uh, additional recommendations because standalone already more than in the UK at the moment, there are more startups started by male, females than by males. So 140,000 startups have been started by females, you know, which is really an incredible amount. I was really thrilled by to hear. But it's clear that women don't feel that they get the access to capital the way they should. And another number just for yourself, you know, in, in Alison Rose calculated that the value for the UK economy would amount to 215 billion pounds. So I'm just giving you large numbers, but bankers are familiar with large numbers. So I hope people don't get afraid. I think it's a huge opportunity. Um, and so it's a huge opportunity to unleash the potential of female emphasis. Now, what did we do in the Netherlands? Uh, we actually looked at, uh, the, the, at those five groups, but I'm going to give you some background on the, on the ent female entrepreneurs, because I think also given the composition of our panel today, I think that's most interesting to share notes with. Uh, so we defined um, uh, female entrepreneurs, you know, people who co-own a business and employ zero to 250 staff, including self-employed contractors. We do have a lot of those uh, self-employed contractors in the Netherlands, and they have revenues up to 50 million euros. And we identified actually four stages. Uh, the life stages of an entrepreneur, and you will all be familiar with them. So the first entrepreneurial stage is the intention stage. People have to come up with an idea. And then, of course, after the intention stage comes the startup stage. Um, inclusive banking. So we surveyed female and male-led businesses to compare notes. So we did both female-led entrepreneurs as male-led entrepreneurs in order to make sure that we were really comparing apples with apples and peers with peers. In the intention and startup phase, our female entrepreneurs were saying that two key barriers were blocking them and are blocking them. And one is low access to awareness, low access to and awareness of capital. And the second is the lack of relatable role models, mentors and sponsors. Now, yeah, uh, not something unfamiliar for many of us. We know that there are too few women in the banking industry and the ones which are there still sometimes, um, you know, have to showcase their capabilities before they're acknowledged as the experts and such. Now, women's and men's rationale for starting a business was perceived to be comparable. However, at the moment, this is the same in the UK. It's really interesting how more women than men start a business to make an impact on society and on the environment. So impact is really important. Purpose is important for women to start businesses. I think that's especially in this world, whether it's on inclusion or sustainability or whatever, it's important to know. Then we go on. And this was the sustain and skill phase. And then we discovered that female and male entrepreneurs, this was an interesting one, state that there were two key barriers, which were one, lack of business skill and capabilities, which of course, when you're scaling up, it gets in a different form. And second, for women, the primary care responsibilities, but also for males, that require additional attention when running a business. Now, yeah, so um, they also both advise that financial advice would be more appreciated. Now, yeah, so in this, interestingly, um, uh, concluding, we could say that, you know, those in-depth interviews with the experts and the entrepreneurs actually substantiated that female entrepreneurs are finding it really hard to attract capital and don't always look good and well understood by a bank and or bankers. Um, and helping female uh, uh, bankers to over helping female entrepreneurs and female and, and bankers to overcome these barriers would imply that there is an imply, uh, implied equal opportunity for women to start a business. Now, I think that's really important because, uh, uh, you know, it's support to start a business, but also an equal to opportunity to scale up a business. Thank yeah, you, Marguerite. Yeah, yeah and I, so to, to find like just one amount. So it's really mm. interesting. And all of this was calculated to be adding one of the 39 billion for the Dutch economy. So it's big numbers, but it's really tangible money laying on the street for bankers to be picked up. And I'm sure that that's what you, thank you very much, Marguerite, for bringing those uh, facts to the table. We really appreciate it. And I think um, I can imagine that both Mariam and Vivian um, have potential solutions or potential work that they're doing to overcome this, do you, which, which of you would like to jump in at this point? I can talk a little bit. Um, we, as we said previously, um, we have a 30 years financial institution company and we also have two fintechs in the last two years. So during COVID, we really had uh, this big uh, surprise about the MoneyGram, I, I just heard Marianne 
work with uh, money, uh, Western Union, right, for international remittances. And we in Brazil are one of the biggest payers of MoneyGram and for international remittances. And during the pandemic, when it just started, we were like on the first month, we had $10 million stuck in the accounts because uh, customers couldn't reach out to the stores to do their cash pickup. So mm-hmm. we, st- we, we were launching this, um, uh, this FinTech, but it would, it would take a while, at, at least one year. And we took like urgently uh, a launch for um, a, a, an app. It's just a simple app where the customer can inform their banking details if, if, it, if it has a bank account and withdraw the money to, to his account instead of going to a, a branch and make a pickup. So this was a uh, very simple, um, uh, technologically, I, I mean, very simple solution that it helped uh, thousands of people that needed that money. And Thank we, you very Yeah, we understand that during this kind of situation, we have a lot of uh, trans, uh, international transactions because you know, people that migrate, they send the money to the to the uh, economies that are worse. So this helped a lot uh, Brazilian economy. Yes, for sure. Yes. Thank you, Marian. Yeah, sure, thank you. And just to add to what Vivian said, fully support and can relate to what she said. Um, what the the crisis created the opportunity of us having to accelerate our digital transformation. So the direct to bank where people can get their remittances directly into their bank account. Uh, we pushed on that. And then, as I think Vivian was talking about as well, and we're seeing it around the world, is this idea of using the mobile device. Because so many people, when you think about inclusion, people have access to a mobile device even more than, you know, a home, right? So um, this whole idea of creating an app, which is a super app, where you can load your remittances onto the app first, which is what we're doing. And then from there, you know, they can have banking services, they can get insurance, etc. Just having all in one super app is something that we're also doing. And again, I think this is where, you know, when I think of the future of banking, to me, in I don't know if, how it is in the other countries, but the customer experience, you know, our sector gets beaten up because we're just not, as people say, very good with consumer and customer experience. I think part of that is just the nature of banking. When people go to the hairdresser or they buy a shoe, they feel good, right? When you do your banking, you just feel like, okay, I just did a chore. So you're never going to get people saying, I love my bank. But when I was trying to think about why is it that we are not, from a customer experience standpoint, at the top of the ch- of the chart, as in, say, tourism. Jamaica is known for tourism. Our customer experience is superb. We have some top companies headquartered here in Jamaica. And what it comes down to for me is technology. So technology, a technology that works, technology that's at the right cost point, if you will. So as you invest, you're doing it efficiently. It's really important. So I know our, our other panelists are technology folks, but I think you know if the banking sector gets that right across the world, Africa, Asia, Latin America, the Caribbean, not just in the developed countries, it can have a leapfrog impact on driving more inclusion. And then one last point I wanted to just say, because I really like the trends that Margaret was sharing, and I think all of us can really relate to that. And you know, one of the things about role modeling, when I joined the banking sector as a CEO, again, I never thought anything of it because it wasn't, you know, the technical part of it wasn't hard. Let's just put it that way. It was really around getting people behind a vision and all of that that, really, that I had to really focus on. But there was only one head of bank in Jamaica of eight that was female when I was joining. Um, and so and now there are actually four. So half of the CEOs of the commercial banks in Jamaica are women, so much so they made such a big thing about it when the fourth person was appointed last year. And so I actually think the world is changing and I agree with more role modeling because something I took for granted as just leading a bank, you know, because in the US, you, you know, you feel like you can do anything. Um, people took so much inspiration from it and other CEOs and boards started appointing people who looked different and more diverse because they realized that they can also run banks. So I think that's a big point and very important. It is a very big point, and it's it's um, quite reassuring that we have a very diverse panel here today that hopefully people can look to uh, for role models, including you, Federico, from the fintech side. You're, what are you thinking about when we're talking about technology and and changing and changing the world and making it more accessible? Yeah, well, I'm, I'm obviously the odd duck here in in uh, almost all female panels, so sorry for that, but. Um, 
I, I, uh, you know, one of the, the topics or, or um, subject that came up is, is digital transformation at, at banks. And um, I've, I've now been in, in the fintech uh, space for, for seven years. And, um, you know, in my view, it's still day one very much when it comes to digital transformation, when it comes to um, the disruption um, that, that technology is causing um, for, for incumbent banks. And to be honest, I think it's 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 um, something that consultants have been selling for uh, more than a decade now. But I I don't think any bank really has finished their digital transformation. I appreciate it's really difficult. It's a regulated industry. Um, Risk taking is 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 hard. But I think um, you know fintechs like like myself, we have a an unfair advantage there that we're starting from scratch. We don't have all those old pipes that legacy technology, um, which which makes it really hard to innovate. Uh, to give you one example, um, I'm working with one of the top 10 banks in, in, in Europe, uh, which I will not name uh, to, in order to, to remain a little diplomatic. Um, but so we're very much uh, helping that bank um, enter or monetize the SME finance or SME credit opportunity across Europe. And um, when I look at their technology, um, they they uh, have indeed built, they have a, a homegrown, so to speak, uh, system uh, that they've patched and, and built upon for the last 30 years. And uh, that makes it extremely difficult for them to, to innovate because from time to time they're trying something, but then their entire ATM network goes down. Or... Um, no, no, you know, seriously um, enough, they, for instance, have a senior architect on call um, who is not working with the, the bank for a long time simply because he's the only one who still remembers how some of the code was developed or, 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 uh, or built a decade ago. And this is a, literally a senior architect because he's been retired for, for a very long time. And so this is still something I, I, I bump into every day. And then if you see how this affects the banking um, um, economics or unit economics, it's really hard to get that cost to income ratio right. And um, because think about it, you need to distribute your products, you need to onboard clients, you need to, because of uh, strict compliance, um, you need to KYC, AML those customers. Then you need to underwrite them, right? Risk, um, which is related to credit risk, it's related to, to, to uh, credit insurance, um, it's related to, um, fraud. Um, there's many risks here that that banks um, and fintechs need need to 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 combat. And so, if you're there, pretty much 80% of the revenue already has evaporated. Then, once the customer is live, you need to you need to monitor the, the clients for, for risk reasons as well. And you need to manage the client relationship. And so, you see very quickly how because of that lack of technology or or, or technology inefficiencies. It's really, really hard for the bank to to, to make that uh, segment uh, profitable, and so that is why um, I think firms like ourselves uh, manage to to um, have uh, exciting and and profitable for us collaborations uh, with with incumbent banks. And when we analyze the unit economics, and we've done some of that work, this is with Oliver Wyman, is uh, we, we are very clearly operating at a, at a cost eighty percent lower. Than in common banks, so we really have a, a raison d'être, right? We we have a real reason to exist because we we do uh, make that segment profitable, and I think in the coming years this will only accelerate. Um, so for me, it's 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 uh, it's a very exciting time indeed. And uh, what I'm personally hoping for is that more and more banks will be embracing those fi- those fintech um, uh, bank uh, partnerships. It is happening um, in Europe. We are a little bit behind uh, vis-a-vis. The, yeah, North America, where you've seen the likes of Goldman, JP Morgan, and others um, actively partnering and even acquiring fintechs, which I think is going to be the next uh, the next wave in, in in Europe as well. Thank you, Federico. And on Andrea, um, you work in the area of international payments, and you're also very much involved uh, with the with the newcomers, the, the fintechs. What are your thoughts on uh, is on, for example, crypto or blockchain, or what's what's the technological changes that are that is making banking more inclusive uh, and potentially also riskier? We've got a, a comment uh, coming through 
about uh, using crypto to move to move currencies when we may not want them to be moved, if I've read the comment correctly. It's undermining the global sanctions, basically. Any so thoughts I, from you, Andrea, or, or anyone? Yeah. I may not be best to, to speak to, to blockchain or, or crypto, but mm -hmm. probably some of, the, some of the kind of fintechs and tech that we're seeing um, coming through to help make banking more inclusive. Look, there's kind of two categories. So there's the kind of fintechs that we're seeing coming through. So some of them you know, are helping enable access to affordable credit through really creative new models, um, like access to earned wages. Um, there's some fintechs that are helping you know, people pay down debt through recommendations related to, to loan consolidation and payment prioritization and broadly giving better debt advice and overall a bunch of tools that are helping income maximization and um, and kind of helping this group plan for the future that traditionally hasn't hasn't been well supported to. So those are the kind of fintechs and technologies that we're seeing coming. But then more broadly in terms of almost enabling technologies, I think what we're going to see um, is you know, related to, to my work, some open banking adoption levels that will continue to, to increase both because um, the pandemic and, and subsequent lockdowns have you know, encouraged more people to become comfortable you know, banking digitally um, and also household finances are just remaining under strain, especially as, as everyone um, is you know, witnessing really serious inflation. I also think that those kind of um, open banking, that regulation, that data is going to lay down tracks very quickly for some new open finance solutions to emerge, like um, related to pensions and mortgages and, and other solutions. Um, so those are some of the kind of tech infrastructure, I suppose, and then tech solutions um, that, we're, that we're seeing coming through. Um, but maybe maybe um, other panelists have, uh, have thoughts on, on the blockchain and, and critical questions. And I think it's important to, um, to pick up on that. What we've, what we've heard from all of you is we've heard about inclusive banking uh, banking for the underbanked, access for women and minorities to people in developing countries. We're talking about technological innovation uh, is opening up banking. We also, what you just mentioned now, Andre, is regulation actually supported this. So the introduction of regulation regarding um, uh, the open banking, so APIs, was actually supportive in making uh, it more accessible. Um, we did hear something about leadership competencies, but, you know, role modelling, having um, empathy required to, to move away from traditional banking towards more inclusive. Um, so we need a, a probably a little bit of a change in mindset as well as technology and probably set policy as well. And we've, we've got 10 minutes to go and I'd like you all to have a final, well, a final word or a final remark. What would you really like to say today? And I'm going to go backwards again. Start with uh, Andrea. Sure. So, so really related to what you were just saying, you know, I, I think there are really exciting tech products and services out there that you know are already changing and will continue to change change the banking world. Um, but to be effective, they need a lot of support. Um, so I think I, I kind of focus on um, maybe the. The, re the rest of the picture to some extent. So as you said, you know, we need regulation that both helps protect consumers, but also enable those innovators. We need business models that don't charge the financially excluded. And um, we need, you know, better communications to help direct those are, who are financially excluded to safe services um, and help incorporate financial education components into existing social programs. And um, we need services for those who can't access the internet or, or mobile banking devices. Um, and overall, I think we really need to keep co-designing all these efforts you know, with end users themselves in order for them to be most effective. Fantastic. Thank you, Andrea. And Federico, if you can also address the blockchain point, well, if you can. Yeah, yeah that, that, that's a nice rabbit hole, of course, to extend the conversation for another, another hour or so or longer. <laughs> um, I, I think the, the um, because obviously, um, you know, blockchain or let's, let's maybe stick to, to crypto, I think very much the way you could look at it is as an asset class for the new world. Mm. And um, if you look at it from that perspective, um, there is definitely ways to make financial services expand, which by definition also would make it more inclusive. The same for DeFi um, is very much a combination of alignment of interest and trust. And as such, I think these um, novel technologies indeed can, can lead to, to, uh, to financial inclusion and the expansion of financial services as a whole, especially as well because the, um, the old asset classes are very much broken. 
and think about bonds, um, you know, I think the number is some somehow like, you know, one one quarter, I think, of the investment grade bonds globally are negative yielding. It's an asset class that is, is bro- been broken for a number of years. And that's also obviously fueling more private investments because there's no more yields to be found in, in, in those uh, fixed income markets. Uh, but it also very much shows of, uh, that, 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 that the real world is no longer connected with those financial markets. There's no connection anymore with bond prices or, or, um, or yields uh, when it comes to, to, to bond, bond prices and, and uh, real nominal interest rates. There's, there's a disconnect. And so many um, claim that crypto is irresponsible, um, is, is uh, um, you know, seeing a lot of speculation and all of that is true. But the reality is also the more traditional uh, financial markets are broken. And that is something I would like everyone to think about um, how um, crypto and DeFi indeed can align trust and, and interest and um, can expand financial services to, to lead to financial inclusion as well. Thank you. I think that was very well said, Federico, on the spot. <laughs> um, so final remarks also from, from uh, Mariam. Sure, thank you. Um, just, I just wanted to just pick up on Federico and Mahesh's mm-hmm. question as well about crypto. I mean, when I see what's going on with Russia and Ukraine and how the, the global response, I had a similar um, comment, which is the benefit of the SWIFT system is that it's actually, you just have to press a few buttons and you can get a response. Once you move to a blockchain crypto world, it's incredibly decentralized. And, you know, I do have the same concern that when we're looking at the fourth industrial revolution and the movement to 5G, the regulators are catching up to the tech companies. The tech companies are speeding ahead. And I think this is going to be, this is another example of that. Crypto has a lot of benefits and we do need the regulators to come in and help us ensure that as we, the benefits get to the constituents that they need to get to. Um, but I do think it's also going to disrupt the models so much and the profit pools that it's going to be a long road. Um, you know, just in terms of just final thoughts, I, you know, I think my my biggest thing is that a lot of pain exists in the world and a lot of innovation comes from resolving pain, true pain points. And a lot of these pain points are in developing countries and you'll see the developing countries continue to innovate because of just what's happening. I think the fact that COVID has happened in the, on a, such a global scale has caused the increased consciousness of the world. And with that, I think people are now willing to expand beyond what their normal roadmap of innovation would be. And so for banking, this idea of inclusive banking, I see acceleration of that. And my, to my banker friends, my colleagues, as I tell you know all of ourselves, we need to think of ourselves not as bankers, but as essentially consumer product companies. We're serving a customer and everything we do, the customer has to be at the center of it. Digital transformation is only great if it's solving a customer pain point, not even just a general problem, a pain point. And so I think that I see a lot of progress happening there. And then finally, you know, this idea around access to capital, which is a pain point primarily for SMEs, and SMEs are the engine of growth in all of our countries, really. I'm really pleased to see the varying models of capital providers, not just banks, but other capital providers and the ecosystem of, in particular, equity, which is where there's a real dearth of equity in these emerging markets, but great businesses. And so I think that's where the world is moving. and I'm happy to see that. And so, you know, we'll just all do our part in that. So thank you. Thank you, Mariam. Um, Vivian. Yes, yes. I'm very happy to hear everyone because uh, I see we are on the same page for this. I, I think the world is leading to that, uh, to bring more technology and services instead of just finance. So we're talking a, a lot about tech fins that are technology companies that offer financial services instead of financial companies that offer services in the in an online basis. So um, I, I think that this is the, the path that we're leading to for uh, new banks and new more democratic and inclusive technology. And I totally agree with Marion about the services that we need to provide, not not just um, bank services, any kind of services to the customer be the center of it all. I think this is um, this is the way we, we should be uh, leading now. And 
it's also about blockchain technology. I think this is a very disruptive uh, technology that should be, uh, it will bring a lot of innovation in the world in all fields, not only financial, but all fields soon. And I hope uh, cryptocurrencies are too, are going to be regulated too. I do believe regulation is the way to uh, make it less uh, dangerous and less frauds, less corruption around the world. I think regulation must be done as soon as possible for crypto too. That's Thank it. you. And final Thank word you. from Marguerite. Before, oh, sorry, did you finish, Vivian? Sorry, you had finished, yeah. Yes, yes. Sorry. Yeah, so I'm not going into the world of crypto because I think uh, that said, I think that for the banking industry, it's extremely important to remain relevant. And mm. as, uh, as Mary actually indicated, relevant to your customers. And I do think that, um, uh, you know, whether it's small or big banks, whether it's, you know, they need to take a very close look at what the requirements and the demand from the customers really is. Instead of thinking that they know what it is or defining it themselves, they need to deep dive into the demand and to the existential questions clients have. I think that the word trust has not been mentioned yet on this call. I think there is a big issue with trust on the banking industry. You've seen the financial crisis in 2008. Uh, I think that uh, the banking industry has done a great job getting it restored. I think what at the moment is going on is that you need to make sure that you, uh, even in mind regulation, uh, you, we are from different regions in Europe. There's a lot of regulation. That's also maybe the reason why the banks are not able to explore their entrepreneurial things themselves and are relying on the fintechs where, uh, where there is not a level playing field. So that's a big discussion in, across the European continent and the UK from time to time. I think that at the end of the day, it's about collaboration and working together, whether it's with fintechs, whether it's with small, big banks, whether everybody has its role to play. And we take a look how we can actually provide and add value uh, and regain the trust of our consumers. And, uh, and especially we do that by listening and engaging with them. Uh, and then hopefully we create an inclusive world and a more inclusive organization, our organizations ourselves. Collaboration, regaining trust, listening, uh, talking, communicating. It's all uh, leadership skills that we need from role models. Thank you very much, everyone. We're out of time. If we, I think um, we finished right on time. And I want to ask uh, Mahesh, did we answer your question? and uh, your question uh, satisfactorily. I'm going to stop streaming now, but we're going to continue to answer the question. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everyone, for coming.